Considered one of the greatest political criminals of all time, Roman Emperor Nero's name became synonymous with evil due to his transgressions. The historic accounts are all full of heinous accusations against the Mad Emperor that portray him as a crazy, lustful, greedy, and horrible human being who had sympathy for no one, especially when it comes to his family. Did he really marry a servant while being dressed as a bride? Is he the most successful Olympian in history? And was he so evil that he is the inspiration behind the Christian myth of the Prince of Darkness? The opposite of Jesus Christ? Welcome to Nutty History, and today let's look at the weird things that were normal for Roman Emperor Nero. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. Nero shared more common traits with certain modern leaders, their inability to swallow defeat and having a loose impulse to cheat. There may have been no democracy back then to stop the count, but there were Olympics to stop his opponent from getting ahead of him. Nero was heavily fascinated with chariot races, and of course, he won all of those races. In 67 AD alone, he conducted 1,100 events and was declared the winner at every single one of them. He was a self-claimed champion, despite being an utter failure, and would force the judges to overturn decisions in his favor. Hmm. And what's crazy is Nero still holds the world record for most Olympic wins. He staked claim to 1,808 Olympic wreaths, which is like winning that many gold medals in the modern Olympics. Michael Phelps? Who again? But why was Nero so successful? Well, obviously by cheating, of course. He entered several events, and with his bodyguard standing ominously close to the participants, you guessed it, he won all of them. The most ridiculous and blatant instance of his cheating was the chariot race of 66 AD. Nero purposely asked his competitors to use four-horse chariots and then he showed up with a team of ten horses. Yet despite his massive advantage, Nero couldn't make it across the finish line. He stumbled off his chariot and the entire race was paused so he could get back in the chariot and continue. However, the Mad Emperor was injured enough that he had to pull out of the race. Still, to the anguish of the other competitors, the judges declared their emperor the winner of the race, inconsequential to who crossed the finish line first, even though Nero never came close to it. Nero was a big fan of the performing arts, and not only did he love to be entertained by them, but he also loved performing himself. His artistic talent was questionable at best, but his aspirations were of the highest order. He wanted to be known as the best artist in the Roman Empire, whose music would magically captivate the audience's attention for hours. There was only one problem. He was nowhere good enough. He stunk, but he was still the emperor, so if he couldn't grab their attention, he was able to restrain it. Nero had gained some knowledge of music as part of his early education. He ascended to the throne at the age of 16 and immediately ordered Terpnus to meet him. Terpnus was the greatest master of the lyre of his time, and Nero asked him to perform for him. After listening to Terpnus sing and perform for many nights, Nero began to practice little by little himself. Now give the man credit. Nero was a dedicated student. He didn't neglect any of the exercises that musicians practiced to preserve or strengthen their voices back then. He would lie upon his back and hold a leading plate on his chest, purge himself by vomiting, and deny himself all foods and fruits at first to the voice. Still, his voice was weak and husky, but encouraged by his progress, he longed to appear on the stage. Finally, he debuted at Neapolis, modern Naples, and even though the theater was shaken by sudden earthquake shock, there was a sign, he continued performing to finish the number. Fortunately, the theater collapsed only after the audience had dispersed, but it seems Nero didn't like the audience running for their lives and not waiting until his performance was done. He wanted them to be so mesmerized by his music that they wouldn't care for their lives or the calamity. Every now and then, in the presence of his intimate friends, he would quote a Greek proverb, meaning, hidden music counts for nothing. Nero wanted to be like the bard of the legendary tales whose performance would enchant people to listen for hours. But sadly, in real life, such magic doesn't exist, especially when one is as mediocre of an artist as Nero was. He may have had an excessive image of himself as a great sportsman, musician, and poet in his mind, though he lacked talent in all of his endeavors. According to historian Borston, Nero soiled the imperial dignity by his buffoonery in the theater, 
and believed he could use his art to bring his enemies to tears and repentance. He even thought about giving up his emperorship and becoming a full-time musician so people would adore him for what he truly was. Clearly, self-introspect wasn't an ability in which Nero was proficient, just like his music. But as history saw, Nero clearly abandoned that idea because the only way he could make people listen to his music was by ordering them to do so. And to have that authority, he had to be the sovereign ruler, which won't be possible after resigning as the emperor. So the solution was simple. Lock the gates of the theater while performing so nobody could get out. His routines were also mind-numbingly long, and the audience was decreed to listen to them attentively and clap. People had to plan complicated escapes or fake their demise to get out of the hellish experience. According to the Roman historian Suetonius, one performance went on so long that a woman gave birth while Nero kept on playing insistently. Not only was Nero a spoiled brat when it comes to the childish antics about winning the Olympics, but he was also a fiend in the bedroom. Stories about Nero's bedroom life show up in every history book related to the ancient Roman Empire. It is so because he surpassed every Roman emperor and their weird shenanigans by long miles, and that is saying something. Tacitus told a story about Nero throwing a massive ceremony that went on for days. The most notorious banquet took place in 64 AD during the festival of God Saturn, Saturnalia, and it was hosted by Tigonelius. It took place on a raft constructed by Marcus Agrippa's lake that was towed above other vessels. The vessel was decorated with gold and ivory fittings stocked with high-ranking ladies. Tacitus even addressed the staff working at this coital event as degenerates. In the end, Nero threw a mock wedding ceremony in which he married a freedman named Pythagoras. Pythagoras was, in fact, one of two men Nero married apart from his three wives. His other husband was a eunuch who Nero married for the sole reason that he bore a striking resemblance to his former spouse, Papiaea Sabina. Nero even dressed and assumed the role of the bride at the wedding. Tigonelius, the host, also performed the marriage ceremony with all customary rituals, including a bridal veil, wedding dowry, and candles. In Christian mythology, there is a prophecy about a charismatic leader who would sway the masses by pretending to be the paladin of morality and virtue to attain power over the world order. But then they would show their true colors as they would use the power to rule with an iron fist and do unspeakable things to humanity before the final judgment is delivered. According to some historians, the inspiration behind this myth may have been Nero. It is well known that Nero had no love for Christians, and he is also the Caesar who was responsible for the demise of the Apostle Peter, one of Jesus' well-known disciples. In the Bible, the number 666 is referred to as the number of the beast, but not a lot of people know the full context behind it. Historians have argued that number is more of a code rather than a prophecy. The verse goes like this, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. Coincidentally, in Hebrew letters, the number that represents Nero Caesar is 666. The book of Revelations has also mentioned that the rule of the beast would be precisely 42 months long, and that coincides with the duration of Nero's reign of the Roman Empire after the Great Fire of Rome. Like the prophecy, Nero too began as Mr. Popular. He was quite well liked among the patrons of arts who were graced with his benevolence. He was also quite popular among the commoners early on for lowering the taxes, giving rights to the servants, and eliminating capital punishment. He also rebuilt residential districts with buildings made of bricks and colonnades to shelter residents from the sun. But he was also the emperor who torched the capital to make room for his domus aurea, and his taxation policy depleted imperial coffers. Over time, his policies and insanities both saw his popularity fade, and the increasing influence of Christianity didn't help either. Thanks for watching Nutty History. Do you know more about the insane activities of Nero? Tell us in the comments. And please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video.